afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Woolard. I'm a partner at EY and I chair our global regulatory network. Um, before that, uh, I spent 25 years uh, in a mixture of government and financial regulation. Today's debate uh, is about crypto and central bank digital currencies, uh, with the slightly controversial title of winners and losers, uh, which we'll, we'll see if there are any winners and losers by the time we finish. Um, we're going to hope to make this uh, as interactive a session as we can. So if you open up the Cyboss app, you are able to put questions uh, to the panel through that. I'll be asking those uh, later on in the session as we go. Just to set the scene very, very briefly before I introduce our panel, um, I think it's fair to say if you went back six, seven years ago, we would think of the crypto world as being very much dominated by um, private activity, uh, that most coins, other uh, tokens that were being used came from very much a, a, a private angle. Uh, we then had a major development in the market, which was Libra, uh, backed by Facebook. And I think we saw central banks very much coming to the party, even if they've been thinking about it for some time. Governments and central banks now beginning to ask the question, well, actually, should this be purely privately run and operated? And since then, I think we've begun to see a variety of things happening. So firstly, central banks wrestling with some of the public policy questions that are here, not only about privacy, but also about monetary policy, what's going to happen about individuals who may be more vulnerable or excluded from society. Uh, at the same time, uh, the development of stable coins, uh, a regulatory regime around them, and then more recently, uh, certainly when we come to think about um, some of the maybe more sort of traditional tokens in this market, if you can call them that, actually, you know, we're seeing very different regulatory approaches around the world, uh, from the US to maybe Europe to, to some of the Asian markets. So there's a lot going on there and a lot to talk about. And I'm delighted to be joined by a really distinguished panel uh, to do just that. So uh, as I move down the line from, from my left, uh, we've got Scott Hendry, who is a senior special director uh, responsible for fintech at the Bank of Canada. We've got Ryan Rugg, who is uh, head of digital assets for Citi, uh, who had a very interesting announcement earlier on today, that no doubt <laughs> will get mentioned. Uh, we've got Jack uh, Fletcher, who's head of policy and government relations for R3. Uh, and then we've got Matthias Schmuder, who is head of payment and securities uh, division at Deutsches Bundesbank. So we have a real mix of people from across the private side uh, of the industry, but also very much from the central bank and the, and the regulatory side of the industry for this debate. I'm going to start by just thinking a little bit about the present um, and that world I just described in my introduction. Um, perhaps, Ryan, if I can come to you first. Just sort of really, do you agree with that characterization of what's been happening over the last sort of six or seven years? Um, and do you think there's anything I've sort of maybe overplayed or underplayed in that? and particularly your perspective as, you know, operating uh, within a bank in, in that environment? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think about my days when I started at R3 back in 2016, and, you know, we tokenized everything from <laughs> bonds to mortgages to equities, and, you know, at that time, blockchain was going to solve world poverty. To, you know, fast forward to where we are today, and, you know, you alluded to it, we announced that we're live with city token services for cash and trade, and what we've done is we've tokenized deposits. Um, why, right? That's This is within the regulatory regime of what, you know, U.S. entity banks can do right now. We can tokenize deposits, but really add that 24-7, 365, always on infrastructure. You know, we're currently live between U.S. and Singapore right now. And where it gets really interesting is that, you know, we're working with the Fed on the regulated liability network to make it not just a city token. We believe in multi-bank, multi-border, cross-border liquidity, also with that programmability. That's what really enhances that. And, you know, programmability from smart contracts is just a series of if this, if this happens, then do that. And I think that really adds benefits to the bifurcated market. So, you know, back at R3, we had started on public chains. We went to private um, we are on a private version of Ethereum right now, it, which will be fungible in the future. It's EVM compatible that if regulation changes with stable coins or crypto and banks, it is permissionable. We'll have the platform built out for our clients. 
Okay, very good. Mm -hmm. So that's very much a sort of, if you like, from the from the cutting edge of industry view. Um, Scott, from a central banker's view, what do you think's happening here? <laughs> Uh, I don't think you over or underplayed anything. I think your, your characterization was very balanced, and I think that's the way to look at the development going forward, that we need uh, to think seriously about the benefits and the risks that come from all of these different types of, uh, of money. And it, it, my point of view is that we exist now with multiple types of money, with central bank money, various types of private money, and the future is going to be the same way. And the technology underlying it is for me largely irrelevant. It's the to make sure that uh, we can trust the money that we use, no matter where it comes from, because uh, money is trust. It's it's really fundamentally based upon that. So uh, we need a central bank money. We need private money. Uh, so whether it's stable coins, commercial bank deposits, uh, tokenized or not, or uh, even various forms of cryptocurrency. Uh, I think there's a, a role for them all to play, and I think the future should enable innovation in, in all of these types of money so that they, people, us, can have choice in what we use when it comes time to make a payment. Yeah, yeah, no, it all makes uh, great sense. But we've all started off, so I've been very balanced. Ryan's been very balanced, you've been very balanced. Um, everyone's going to sleep, right. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Jack, I'm gonna, look at you to try and <laughs> spark it to life spark, spark us up a little bit here and when you boil this down though i mean particularly from r3's perspective what's the holy grail that i think everyone's trying to achieve here you know what's the industry trying to really drive towards with this with this sort of wave of innovation and you know what are some of the challenges that are really out there that we've got to face into sure with permission to be pointed yeah so i i think um, I guess the question invites me to not think about what's likely, but what could happen, and I think that's quite a fun place to be. So if we think about digital currencies, we've been dancing along sort of two lines of debate. We, we have that kind of uh, public money, private money, uh, interoperability stuff that um, I think we've you characterized very nicely. We've kind of worked out what that is and what, therefore, private money in the form of a stable coin or a cryptocurrency kind of looks like and what the risks are there. And then that wholesale retail debate. So maybe if I can kind of start with the, or focus on the, um, the, the, the I guess the more topical of those is that retail CBDC debate. It's the one that you see, you know, American senators uh, say we'll die in a ditch to prevent type thing. You know, where are we, we think about that, I, I guess there are many motivators in the world for why you might develop a retail CBDC. And I think what one of the one of the motivators is is that um, trend that we're seeing globally of saying cash is becoming redundant or will become redundant. Might happen in ten years, might happen in twenty years, might happen in a hundred years. But what is it that we're all place cash? So you un you unpick that. What is it about cash that we might want to retain? And there are kind of three characteristics that I would kind of point to. There are lots of them, but, but perhaps three to start with. It's the idea that you can make. Um, uh, you can you can deal with with safe central bank money that's kind of taken as a given for cash that you can do so um, without the need to give your identity to the extent that by it's anonymous and then that it is censorship resistant so I can buy whatever I wish to buy in cash no one's going to prevent me at that point of transaction unless something else is happening unless I'm being you know observed by the feds type stuff so what is it that we think the future world should look like and what do we need to do now to create the kind of world that we're all content with? And, and one of the roles for me that I think is, it, it, I particularly enjoy is that having conversations with central banks about the kind of things they need to think about there. And you don't get too long into this conversation before you, frankly, you, you bump up against the hard reality of what digital payments looks like now and that well-embedded regulatory environment that says these are the rules for behaving in that space. And those rules don't look like anonymous payments using uh, a, a CBDC. Now, we can be content with that. We can be uncontent with that. I think that's the, the, the role of a central bank and governments to come is to work out that balance between uh, rights and responsibilities and how they kind of play out. But the, the thing that they haven't done and that they will be doing is this third element, which is to say, and people need to want to use it because it's all well and good navigating this 
well, these are the responsibilities and these are the rights. But if you produce something at the end of it that no one wants to use, you've wasted a lot of time and money. So, you know, there's a lot of space in there for us to kind of get into the weeds. But, you know, we're a tech company. We support the tech. We kind of walk you through what the possibilities are there. But there's an awful lot of policy that needs to be worked out um, if we're to have something that's in any way unique, in my opinion. Yeah. Okay. And then, turn to Matthias. I mean, from... Uh, from your perspective, as, as one of the people who may have to work out what some of that policy looks like, um, I mean, there is a lot of speculation out there at the moment about, you know, will we get to digital euro? Will we get, uh, you know, a retail CBDC that becomes the basis for new, maybe more innovative products or innovative contracts and those kind of things? What's, what's your perspective of where you think this is going in terms of that kind of holy gra grail question? <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. Well, as you know, in Europe, we're in the midst of developing the digital euro. Um, there will be a decision next month by the governing council of the ECB to step into the next phase of the project. Um, and I can tell you it's, it's a broad range of questions we are dealing with. Um, and from my point of view, the main aim is to, to make cash fit for the digital age, uh, and mm. retail CBDC um, is something that will do this job, because by cash you can't pay online, uh, you, you can't do all the stuff uh, like um, payments under certain conditions. Um, and um, I'm, I'm not that shy, I, I would also say um, that the digital euro um, is an offering for the main use cases for cash or payment that we're having now, so at the point of sale, P2P, e-commerce, um, and it's an offering by a central bank, um, which is currently offering bank notes and is a, is a trusted party. It's central bank. It's the only way uh, that a private person comes into contact uh, with the central bank by the digital euro. Um, it will take some time. Of course, it takes a lot of effort to talk to the stakeholders. That's what we are doing. Yeah? So we are talking to the politicians. We now have the first proposal for a framework for the digital euro. Yeah? And it's a good coordination that, that took place there. And we are also to talking to the stakeholders. So banks, payment service providers play a, a big role in, in the uh, issuance of a digital euro. Um, and we are talking also to a lot of associations. Um, inclusiveness is one of the aspects. Privacy is, is a big thing. Um, the form factors will most likely also include a, a card so that those who are not uh, so much into the electronic and, and digital <laughs> ways of, of paying uh, don't have an, an app or a wallet uh, that they can pay by the digital euro. Um, so that's my perspective, uh, and, and it's the new form of money issued by central banks. Maybe we are a little late compared <laughs> to all these private initiatives, but I'm sure we will come. It's also interesting, like certain countries have made it compulsionary for a city, like mm. CBDC, to operate in those regions with it. And I think we'll see more and more as we get regulatory clarity that certain central banks will want to use the rails mm. or of the, these network of networks that are out there. Because we, we do have countries that have demanded that we operate within their CBDC. Yeah. And I mean, where you've had that experience, I mean, are there any particular sort of lessons you, you draw from it? Not, not necessarily that one, but like from my R3 days to my IBM days to now City, no two are designed the same. It's wholesale, retail, hybrid. What the pain point they're trying to solve? Is it financial inclusion? Is it you know mismatches in the financial system? So one of the issues with CBDC is everyone has very bifurcated views on that. And that's why you're seeing these different models kind of evolve and the lack of interoperability also in them. So I think that, you know, Regulation will give clarity, but you need a, like a set of standards for kind of that truly global interoperability. Otherwise, we're kind of just creating siloed payment systems again yeah. within the individual country, which is not what we're trying to solve here. Okay, we'll come back to that in a minute. <laughs> um, in terms of though, you know, the, this question maybe for Scott before we move on to the kind of well, okay, where's this going next? But if you just strip away everything we've just spoken about if you if you think about really the kind of the, the the sort of the core of this and you know you already said being pretty neutral about the technology so it you know it could be stable coin it could be a central bank digital <coughs> currency it could 
it, it could even be some other kind of token. But from a central bank perspective, you know, what are the what are the characteristics that one of those things will need to have, or maybe more than one of those things will need to have, to actually be successful from a from a sort of central bank's perspective? There, there's probably a number of um, characteristics that they'd have to have, but the the main one that we've already alluded to is uh, demand from the public. Uh, whatever is built, whether no matter what, whether it's from the private sector or the, the central bank, uh, it needs to be uh, used by the public. It needs to be adopted to a certain extent to uh, achieve a critical mass, to, to form the network that is necessary to, to support the system and justify the system, and justify the investment, uh, and uh, be useful to the people. Yeah. Um, like to me, to add on top of Matthias, it's... CBDC is really about taking existing central bank money and making it more usable in the digital world. Like right now, our money is not usable in the digital world, retail money. Uh, so we need to uh, upgrade that. Uh, and uh, so I, we're not thinking about CBDC to fix a use case, but we are thinking about CBDC to make our money more usable. And mm. I, that's a, a different perspective. Uh, but to make it more usable or, or demanded or adopted, uh, we have to think seriously about what people want. Is it, is it the uh, privacy in payments? Uh, we already offer the most private form of payments out there. How much of that can we uh, pour it over to the digital space? We put a lot of investment into privacy enhancing techniques mm. uh, to try and understand what can be done while still being compliant with regulation. Uh, and then what can we make believable and credible to the public? Uh, th there's a lot of different nuances in there that are very important that need to be sorted out yet. Uh, right now, privacy enhancing techniques work well when you can take a few minutes or hours to do a, a wholesale transaction. They still have a long way to go to make uh, micro transactions, like something that will process uh, in less than a second to do really good retail transactions. So there's there's a lot of development that still needs to go on uh, to make things more usable and and to capitalize on what people want. Uh, offline payments, private payments. Like there's a lot of different nuances that we need to investigate further. Okay. So that's where we are. We're now going to get our panel to start to get their crystal balls out and actually start thinking about the future and where maybe some of this is this is headed. I'm going to come back to our central bankers first, actually, just to put you on the spot. Um, so, Matthias, I mean, where do you think this is headed next? And most importantly, and I think probably many of the people who might have turned up here and are interested in this debate will probably want to know how fast do you think this is headed into the future? Because I think we can we can all sketch the kind of scenarios we've just been doing on this stage, but really the the pace at which might, some of this might happen is really the critical piece. So, so what are your thoughts on that? Well, pace is uh, for sure one, one aspect of the journey. Um, the other aspect is um, we as central banks are conservative. Um, we are not fintechs with a trial and error approach. Um, all the actors should, as they do now, rely on us also in future. So it, it takes some time. And to get the buy-in, we think it's important to explain, it's important to talk, to exchange arguments, and come to a solution that is really beneficial for everyone in the ecosystem. And it's a two-sided market, it's a network industry, we have to take uh, into account interoperability, uh, maybe we start with a release of a certain content and extend, um, there might be technological changes, improvements, uh, like DLT came up a couple of years ago, uh, this might happen in future <laughs> even <laughs> more, more often. Um, so it's not easy work, and we have a mm. huge team working on the digital euro, um, and the, the closer you come to the issuance, the, the more questions <laughs> will, will come up. Um, and so it's, it's not time. Uh, it, it has to be carefully worked out. Um, but I'm confident myself that there is a place for digital central bank money. And 
what uh, what what I, I also can can say it's 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 the original. Yeah, all the stable coins they are stable because there's a fiat currency behind. There's a euro. There's a yen. Um, but if the people can have the real euro in a digital form or the real dollar, um, wh wh why should they take uh, a replica? Yeah, they should go for the original. Yeah. Okay. Well, I suppose I just, just to sort of press slightly on that. I mean, I. As a regulator, I dealt partly with LIBOR transition. And I can remember everyone saying, oh, yes, LIBOR transition. We must have, you know, LIBOR, Eurobor. You know, all these transitions must occur. It wasn't the point at which until dates started to be set that everyone suddenly started, wait, hang on, this is real. This is really starting to happen now. It's not just a sort of an academic mm -hmm. debate. And without asking you to do something silly like name a date, because you can't do that, and there's probably the press in the room as well. But... but in terms of thinking, you know, how far are we away from that moment where you think, you know, colleagues around the world will start in major economies to really start to put in some timelines here? Do you think we're a long way from that? Or do you think that, you know, even within the careful planning you've just talked about, we might start to see a few, a few key headlines begin to emerge? Well, it will take a couple of years, so it's a medium-term uh, project um, on the retail sphere. Mm. Um, demand is lacking. Mm. Uh, what we see is more demand on the wholesale space. So mm. maybe there will be a, a, a change. Um, and the reasoning for central banks being active in, in wholesale payments is it's much, much more. Yeah? Mm. So uh, the PFMI uh, tell us that settlements payments have to be made in, in central bank money. We are talking about a lot of uh, high amount payments, large value payments, um, and counterparty risk is even higher. Uh, and, and so uh, maybe this will will uh, be uh, earlier than we expect it uh, to be. And um, we, we will start next year in spring with some trial and experience with real central bank money in the wholesale yeah. sphere with three different models. And we are asking all the market actors to, to try to tell us what they like, what, the, what they don't like. Um, be because in this space, um, there are a lot of, of uh, CCPs, CSDs, big market actor, asset chain providers, um, and, and they are asking for real central bank money for the settlement of, of their transactions. Yeah, there's a lot of market demand, um, and um, well, we, we are following both parts and, and uh, try to offer central bank as a modern way of payment for the digital age. Yeah, that's great. And Scott, have you got any perspectives on that? I certainly agree with everything that was was said there that uh, I don't think we're on a fast track in most countries, but it should be pointed out that there are already yeah. several CBCs that have been issued. Uh, the, the largest economy would be China, but it's not a full rollout yet. Uh, but several have been issued, slow adoption, but they are growing. Uh, I don't think in uh, G7 and other developed countries it's going to happen very fast, uh, but uh, we're going in that direction. Uh, there's uh, a lot of pushback, largely because the, the current market is pretty well served. Uh, there is pretty good digital payments in, in all of our economies. Uh, so that makes the ad adoption road for CBDC that much harder, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't try. Or sh or there isn't an argument for it. Uh, so I don't think it's going to happen uh, overnight, but I think we will eventually get there depending on what the progress is or development is of uh, various cryptos and stable coins and what the, uh, the progress is for um, cash, whether mm. it's going to disappear. Uh, the Bank of England gave out a date of some time towards the end of the decade, but that's still just a very loose number. Uh, so I think it will be a long road while we sort out how to do it uh, in the best fashion that we can with the right technology. Um, and uh, do we need it at the retail level as well as the wholesale level? Uh, it's my opinion that we already have wholesale CBDC. It's just not blockchain-based. Uh, so we need to really think seriously about uh, what do we need from a technology perspective. Uh, do we really need a blockchain-based central bank money? Uh, it's all about interoperability, so we need to be able to link up these various blockchain or distributed ledger platforms, but we also need to link them with a legacy system. Uh, 
because the legacy systems or centralized systems are going to be here for a very long time, if not forever. So we need uh, a full interoperability platform or, or methodology. Uh, so there will be different uh, types of money for a very long time, and we need to make sure that money can flow uh, back and forth in its different forms. Very good. Right. So what that tells us is there is a space. Um, I'm going to ask Jack and, and, and Ryan about that in just a second. Just a reminder, we are going to come to your questions in a second. We've got a few already, but um, if you've got any more, do, do, do send them in now. Um, so, Jack, I think you know, there's clearly a gap here. It may well be filled by a variety of things. So it could be stablecoin, it could be other tokens, it could be uh, you know, services we haven't even perhaps imagined yet. But from a from a commercial perspective, what do you think is 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 out there in the medium term, short to medium term? And are there things in particular that excite you? Are there things that, you know, this is your chance for a quick advert for R three? <laughs> um, I, well, I mean, there are a number of things where um, the traditional infrastructure doesn't seem to be doing what we want it to do. Um, and a good example of that is cross-border payments. So um, that's not to say that the only solution to this is, is DLT. There are, there are other ways of solving some of these problems. But if we think about the um, certainly the fees that those involved in, f in foreign currencies or those that are sending money from sort of not obvious places to not obvious places, remittance payments, um, those people are hit very hard by the existing infrastructure. Um, and I think you know it's well recognised by G20, sort of all, all of those sort of types of groups that that isn't the world we want to live in. Even as someone who I currently live in New York, I might send myself money in London. I lose it for two days. I incur fees. Um, in a world whereby you can send messages, you know, via email instantaneously, that feels like perhaps the speed at which I'd like these sort of things to move. The Embridge project is a really interesting project that's, c that's coming out of um, uh, the BIS in Hong Kong. There's a similar project with the BIS in Singapore, uh, Dunbar. Those are looking at how you can set up those sorts of infrastructures. Um, I, th I think I can see those being those being pushed upon. There's lots of momentum there. Uh, that isn't to say that, that that's the only show in town. The, we've been involved in quite a few wholesale projects, um, cross-border ones too. Um, Helvetia is one that the, the Swiss Central Bank are involved with. Their, their kind of latest iteration of that is doing precisely the kind of things that, that, that Scott and Mateus are talking about, which is to say, what do we need in this infrastructure? What actually best serves the marketplace? Is it a trigger solution? Is it a stable coin? Is it a wholesale CBDC? And part of that is looking at demand. And if the demand is, is frankly not really there, then a trigger kind of looks like perfectly satisfied um, solution. If actually you're expecting uh, large-scale corporate involvement in tokenized assets and trading and wanting to, mit to mitigate and, and minimize the risk that's involved in those, a wholesale CBC looks like a very good product to have. And, and, and as Matthias talks about, you know, settling in the, the least riskiest asset form points to a wholesale CBDC. The, uh, you know, I, I guess there are different attitudes from different central banks here. There is a kind of well-founded conservatism within lots of central banks. Coming first, so to speak, is 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 actually kind of almost frowned frowned upon, sort of viewed with suspicion in this space because you'll you'll learn lessons from those that do fall. So why not just watch them and then try and make yours a bit better? <laughs> it's not necessarily the kind of innovative attitude that we that we ourselves kind of adopt because you need to fall and then you learn and then you make it better. Um, and we are seeing lots of central banks willing to engage in that process, willing to learn, willing to move forward. But it's it's new for them, you know. It, it's it's they're asking themselves a whole bunch of questions that they haven't had to ask before. You know, technology has um, uh, gone into change an awful lot of different industries, and for some time it's been coming for finance and it's coming for money, and central banks having to ask themselves how do we respond. Uh, CBCs is one way in which they can respond. Yeah, Ron. Yeah, you know, listening to what you know Jack was saying, we're definitely at an inflection point. And you can feel it, like the amount of regulatory diligence in this space. If it, you know, we're part of the Euro Digital Euro Working Group, also the guidance coming out of MICA, ECB, the MAS, the bipartisan bill in the U.S. 
it feels like an inflection point. You know, we haven't had this much kind of enhanced diligence on this in quite some time. As in regards to your original question, like timing on it, you know, I can tell you that the regulators that are more forward thinking, you see more adoption and you see kind of, you know, more pass forward on that. But, you know, if any of these bills get passed or with, let's say, the bipartisan bill in the U.S. with non-stable coin, non-banks being able to issue stable coins, you know, we're at roughly $120 billion right now. There's projection that grows to 2 or $3 trillion. And, like, our, collectively our system is ready to handle that if our clients start demanding. And that's what we're really doing is future-proofing our infrastructure for our clients that if they want to use these other means of payments or CBDC or whatever, we have the rails set up for them. Right, I'm going to come to some of the questions now. Um, I'm just going to look for volunteers. And I'll, I'll, I'll throw it at people yeah. if need be. But um, a couple of the questions are around the theme of actually taking us back really to sort of fundamental roots of this, of sort of, you know, what, what, what problem are we solving for here? But also, particularly, I think, in, in more developed economies, if we've got, uh, you know, a pretty well-developed faster payment system, liquidity in bank accounts, et cetera, you know, actually, what, what, what are we really solving for, again? Even if, you know, there are clearly some countries who are using this as a way of kind of leapfrogging technologies or whatever it might be, if we, if we think about where the big, big, big money is in terms of adoption, and we think about, you know, G7, G20, um, kind of, what, what are we trying to solve here? And we've already touched on some of the answers. I mean, you, Jack, you already said some of it, but anybody want to have a, have a go at that in a nutshell? Yeah. I'll, I'll start. You know, I think of digital currencies like day one. What we're trying to solve for is, you know, a lot of our large multinationals have capital locked in different regions. And you have multiple bank accounts. You have multiple regions that you deal with. Being able to have that always on infrastructure that can operate 24-7, 365 with no, no downtime. So, like, that's day one, you know. In the future, that, you know, being able to have autonomous settlement and other asset classes on there, because you need the always-on infrastructure, and how are we going to facilitate for that client? And, like, this is one of the technologies that enables it. I'm not saying it's the only one, right? It doesn't matter about the technology, but that's one of the pain points that we hear from clients. Yeah. I'll jump in there. Like, question there, why do customers really need central bank money? Uh, I think that's a fundamental question, one that... Uh, we have to come to grips with first. Uh, I would tweak it a bit and say, why does the economy really need retail central bank money? And I think there's a good argument for that. And the individual need co comes from that is that uh, we need an alternative to private money. And the, uh, our economies have benefited from that alternative for many, many years. That we don't want or don't think that people should be locked into the private sector. I know I'm speaking to the private sector for the most part. But it's actually good for people to have an alternative, that if they choose, they can leave. And if they leave uh, for a time and then move over to the next bank or other provider, that's fine. But there needs to be an outlet where I can move from one institution to the other. Or if I want, I can get out of all institutions. And for most parts, if uh, the economy is working well, that need is very low. But occasionally we reach a time where lots of people want to get out of the private sector and there's a crisis and there needs to be that door. And we want that door to always be there because if there's no door, that's when the panic gets higher mm. and much greater. So uh, think of what the world would have been like uh, if cash and retail money, central bank money had disappeared before the great financial crisis. We still would have had the crisis we still would have had COVID, uh, the world would have been a much worse place afterwards because people didn't have that out. And lots of people out there don't understand deposit insurance the way we do. Mm. So they do move into cash when there's uncertainty. Mm. Uh, they did it during, again, the, the financial crisis. They did it again during COVID. There is value to having that out. And we don't value it every day. Uh, but there are circumstances, and there are people out there who value it all the time. Uh, not just, again, us who are very educated on how the payment system works. Some people want to function in central bank money. Uh, many times because it's private right now, uh, but also just because it's secure. We, we, we call it anchor function. Yeah? So the, the private money is anchored in the central bank money, 
and the, the, the people really like that they can take out cash out of any ATM, ATM of, of any bank to get central bank money, and this also provides trust mm. to the mm. banking industry uh, d d doing that, and that's one important aspect for the uh, issuance of a, of a digital euro in, in Europe. Um, another aspect is, um, in a way, of a failure of, of the banking industry in payments in Europe, because we don't have an autonomous European payment instrument. Uh, we, we are not able to provide retail payments just in, in Europe. We have to rely on the big uh, credit card <laughs> companies and, and others, and maybe uh, in future more rely on, on big techs. Uh, they have payments not because they like it, but because they collect data and, and stuff like that. So uh, European autonomy is really highly connected to the issuance of a digital euro in the retail sphere. Yeah. It's not that we don't like the, the big techs. Uh, I use them every day and uh, a lot of people. It's not that we don't like to use the MasterCard, Visa, MX uh, credit cards. Um, but given also the geopolitical development that we see, um, we, we think it's important for, for Europe to be in, in a way able to provide services um, also with our capacities and not relying on, on any provider somewhere in the world who may like us to tomorrow, but not anymore <laughs> the yeah. day after tomorrow. Yeah. So. Very good. And just take one other question there before we, we, we give you all a chance just to reflect on the panel. Um, this question of interoperability keeps coming up. And I think there is that danger that, you know, if you go back to 18th century Europe, you know, banks could issue paper notes, but other banks wouldn't accept notes issued by those banks. You know, each, each bank having its own stable coin, for example, is exactly the same kind of scenario just in a digital world. Um, but, but what do you think about this sort of question of coexistence that, you know, whether it's central bank money, whether it's uh, stable coins, that, that, that we will see a diversity in the next few years? And, and how do you solve for that interoperability question? And maybe I'll put that to the middle of the <laughs> middle, middle of the panel to start with and then work my way out to the edges. Yeah, I think about what we're doing with the regulated liability network with RLN and mm -hmm. working with 12 other banks. We you know, concluded the US one in July and we're working with the UK one now. Um, really helps to like, not just from a technical, but from a legal accounting, like what is a proper framework for this to exist and how could it work, right? How can you build out that FMI that is not owned by one entity, right? But is for the interests of the people and the corporations in it. And, you know, we've published a paper on it and it is feasible. And I think that's kind of the, one of the examples of a hybrid that we can do. But, you know, once those rails are built out and you have open APIs and SDKs for the, C the central different central banks, you still need an AMA in the middle, like an automated market maker to like, to kind of mint and burn and exchange the tokens. But I do think that interoperability is key in the future, not just from a protocol standpoint, but from also like a token standpoint. You don't want siloed, that, that's recreating the issues we already have, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah it's, it's good. Right? I think if we think about some of the, um, I guess, Web3, to use a kind of um, modern term, to say, what does the future of, of um, various different marketplaces look like? And if you, you can imagine a world whereby if you're trading your, your home, the kind of tokenization of, of property, it's something that, that is, is currently trying to be ventured in Spain and a number of other countries. In that kind of marketplace, okay, it, there's a real benefit to peer-to-peer. -peer. If, you're, if you're selling a home, you want to be paid in, in real money. So how do we connect that kind of marketplace with real money? And you know, wh where we think of it, we think a scenario where a central bank might want, want to issue on a platform like, like ours, but actually ours might not be the best platform to, to make those sort of house trading things. You could argue that it might be, but let's just say that it isn't. And actually, the important thing for us, and, and one we've recognized for a little while now, is that you need to interoperate. So we, we launched a, um, an EVM interoperability sort of um, protocol uh, a few months ago, um, and something that we'll be building upon because we recognize that, frankly, you know, we're, we're categorized as a private permission ledger. That's not necessarily going to be the optimal solution for everyone, but actually there are really good use cases like CBDC where it perhaps is. And so it's incumbent upon us to work with 
the marketplace, central banks to think, actually, let's make it interoperable. Let's make it so you can move money across platforms um, and kind of facilitate what that what that new interesting stuff looks like. And the, the money stuff will go back, hopefully, to being boring. You know, the, the exciting bit will be the fact that selling your house doesn't take six months because it's on paper, but it takes, you know, a week because actually it's all kind of lined up. Um, and that that's really exciting. Cool. Yeah, I think uh, um, coexistence and interoperability is key. And coming back to your historical example, uh, yeah, we used to have uh, all the banks issued their own money. And... Uh, that worked poorly for a while. It took several rounds of uh, regulatory updates to get us to a point where all the different banks were issuing a dollar, and it was considered to be a dollar across them, and money could move freely, and that um, it moved into government money. It could at, at times, too. So it requires good regulation, and it requires a good settlement system for between uh, these different monies. So you need coexistence, and you need interoperability. Uh, but it needs a regulatory structure that we have confidence in. There's really no reason why we can't have crypto and stable coins and bank deposits and central bank money if the regulatory structure is proper across all of them and that uh, value, if it's supposed to be a dollar, that everybody treats it as a dollar and it trades uh, back and forth. If it is something that doesn't want to be a dollar, then that needs to be cleared of everyone, and then it's something else. We already have multiple currencies around the world, and that's not a problem. We just need to make sure that there's trust in them. If they're gonna be used for payments, uh, the people need to be able to trust that, uh, that that payment's gonna go through, and that the value that they have there is going to, to be maintained. So uh, we need to work out the details of how to get to this point, there's really no reason why it's uh, unattainable. And if there's groups that are looking to run around this regulatory structure, well, that's an entirely different matter. Uh, issuing something just to avoid regulation mm. is going to be a problem. Yeah. Mm. Okay. May, may I add one Please. aspect from a practical yeah. point of view? Um, so there's a lot taking place behind the scenes. Uh, in the CPMI context, um, in talking between central banks and for the Digital Euro project, I can tell you that the standards that we are choosing are open standards. It's no legacy. It's uh, state-of-the-art standards, so easy to interoperate, easy to work together, and we should learn from the mistakes uh, of the past. And also the SWIFT role, I, I would underline, is, is quite uh, prominent, and we are participating in the sandbox, uh, experimenting with other CBDCs and with RT GS connected to the new world. Um, so a lot going on that might not be in the headlines of the press. <laughs> okay, very good. I'm just going to end on one very, very quick reflection from each of you. Um, if you were to try and sort of pitch yourself sort of 10 years from now, and we come back to this question of kind of winners, losers, what would you be expecting in terms of what this, what this sort of ecology looks like? Is it going to be dominated by things that are backed ultimately by government? Is it going to be still a very mixed ecology? Um, do you think that you know possibly the innovation that we're seeing at the moment in the in the commercial sector is just basically going to kind of outstrip some of the pace here? Um, a whole twenty seconds each to sort of forecast the future, Scott. Uh, I don't think corner solutions are very good in any circumstance. <laughs> so I think there's a role to play for these different types of money. They just have to be on a strong footing, and we need to work out that. Yeah, I definitely feel we're at a reflection point, as I mentioned before. If you think about the advent of various technologies from the Industrial Revolution to electricity to supply chain, you know, you could never connect the dots looking forward, only backwards, right? And I feel like we're at one of those points, like we, from the regulatory regime that we're looking at, from all the interest in enterprises as well as retail, I feel like we're at one of that. And it's important that, you know, from my perspective, we support our clients on this journey. I think there's been an awful lot of work done to recognize what is what in this space, what is a private liability, what is a public liability, and what risks exist there. I, I can well imagine a situation in 10 years' time where, frankly, the, the, um, any gray area or a stable coin that isn't a stable coin is, is well and truly ironed out. And mm. if, you, if you're operating as a, on a security basis, you're a security. If you, know, if you want to settle in public money, then you, you have a, a retail or wholesale CBDC. I think it will just be much clearer what everything is. And I could well imagine marketplaces for all these things, but I think there'll be lost much less uh, you know, 
accident that might happen? Well, I think in 10 years we will have more efficient, more digital ways of payments. Central banks will out, be out there with central bank money, and it will be a kind of, of co cooperation, competition uh, between private and, and public money. Um, and this will help the economy, so everyone can choose. But um, the security and regulation is, is key to provide the security and, and also risk-free way of payments with high efficiency. Brilliant. So it just remains for me to say thank you to our panel for making what is a really complex topic, I think, enjoyable and as simple as we possibly could. Um, it's also fair to say, I suspect, if we come to the next Cybos and the Cybos after that and the Cybos after that, a version of this debate will be rerun. The, the, the sense of inflection point is definitely there. But can I just uh, ask you all to put your hands together and just say thank you to our panel in the traditional way. Thank you.